Good morning. It is uh, it's my privilege to introduce this morning's speaker, Evan Marbury. Evan and his lovely wife Katrina, as Jonathan Moore says, like the hurricane, uh, came to Covenant College from St. Louis, where Evan received his MDiv and counseling degree from Covenant Seminary. Uh, in addition to his burgeoning RD acumen, Evan is a bit of a movie buff. He is an acclaimed vocal performer, and he is a man not content to ask easy questions. We are grateful that he and Katrina have joined the Covenant community, and that he is willing to bring God's word to us this morning. Please join me in welcoming our own Evan Marbury. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain Lowe, for that unexpectedly generous introduction. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, would you meet me in John chapter 4? And while you are turning there, let me just say what an honor and a privilege it is to share in the Word of God. And thank you to Covenant College and to Chaplain Lowe for this awesome opportunity, not only to break the bread of life, but also to reflect on the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., Thank you, thank you. So in John chapter 4, <clears throat> very familiar passage of scripture. We've been looking at the woman at the well. Uh, for the sake of time, I won't read the entire passage, but I would encourage you to keep your Bibles open because we will be looking at most of this passage. But I did want to read uh, one sentence that kind of boggled me as I was studying this passage. Simple sentence in verse 4. It says simply... And he, Jesus, had to pass through Samaria. It's interesting to me because the theme of this book is to express the divinity and the deity of Jesus. And I can imagine a first century reader seeing this and saying, the, the God of the universe had to do something? Uh, if I was a first century reader, I would really be interested on what was going to follow after a sentence as peculiar as this. And that's what we will do for the next few minutes. But before we do that, will you pray with me? Lord, thank you for the privilege of knowing you. Lord, I ask that as I speak to the ear, you would speak to the heart and transform lives. Thank you that your word is active and living and sharper than any two-edged sword. I ask that you would pierce us now. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. It was on November 4th, 1956, that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stood before a congregation in Montgomery, Alabama, and he said these words that have become one of the most famous quotes of his life. He said, you must face the tragic fact that when you stand at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning to sing all hail the power of Jesus' name and dear Lord and Father of all mankind, you stand in the most segregated hour of America. That quote is so interesting to me for many reasons. One, Dr. King said this in a time when basically everything was segregated. Restrooms were segregated, restaurants were segregated, waiting rooms were segregated. Virtually everywhere you looked, there was segregation, but he took particular interest on 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. He took note of the church. It was a critique of the church. You don't have to read Martin Luther King's history long before you learn that one of his greatest frustrations in his life was the church. The church seemed to be ferociously committed to keeping things how they were. They did not want to endure the discomfort of change. Secondly, this quote is very interesting because I notice, can't help but notice, how much it resonates even still today. I mean, the statistics are clear. You take the average church, you pluck it up and put it some 50 years in the past, and the average person of that day will say, yeah, that's, that's about right. It's pretty, pretty typical. 
Martin Luther King's contention was that you are to embody the gospel in a way that you are to love your neighbor. But the church did not seem to want to endure that. They wanted to avoid the tension. They wanted to avoid being uncomfortable. They wanted to avoid being creatively maladjusted, as Dr. King would say. I've seen this in my own life. I remember a few years ago, I used to work at a bank, and uh, pretty early on, I met this young lady who was a coworker, and she, I found out really early, like the first day, that she loved the Lord, and I was very refreshed. Um, and we got, we became very close, very close friends, and we would love to talk about the Bible, we would love to talk about theology. She even wanted to attend seminary. At some point in our conversation, she realized that I was in seminary and that I was a preacher and I was becoming close with uh, her husband as well. And they told me, hey, next time you preach, let us know. We would love to come and support you. So I was like, sure. Well, some time after that, I was invited to preach at a Korean church. So I was like, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm allowed to preach at this church. So I went and told my friend about this and said, hey, I'm, I'm preaching on this Sunday. Will you be available to come? Uh, she said, yeah, sure. What, uh, what's the church? And I told her the name of the church, and actually Korean was actually in the name of the church. Uh, so she paused and said, oh. And I was like, so are you going to be able to come? And she asked me a very unexpected question, but she gave some kind of insight into how comfortable we became with each other. She asked me, uh, are any white people going to be there? Uh, and I said, I, I, I don't know, but it's a Korean church, so I would imagine if there's not, you and I both are probably going to be a little alone race-wise, you know. <laughs> uh, so I, I can't predict that for you. Well, um, she was like, okay, well, let me go uh, back and, and talk to my husband, and then we'll, I'll get back to you. I was like, okay. So she came back, and uh, I, I asked her uh, about coming to, to support, and she said, Evan, I, I, I just don't feel comfortable going if white people aren't going to be there. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was taken aback. Uh, she loved me, she loved the Lord, uh, but it was uncomfortable for her to step into a setting where there weren't familiar faces. And I was a little hurt, I was confused, but honestly, when I thought about it, I couldn't get that mad because when I took inventory of my own life, my own life was fairly similar. The church that I went to, the friend groups that I had, my circles of influence, they were, they were all black. I didn't feel comfortable being around people who were different from me. Kind of reminds me of uh, of this song by, by Paul Simon. Uh, Paul Simon, he, uh, he critiques people who seem to be obsessed with being comfortable, who don't want to engage with those around him. It's, it's I am a rock. He says, I am a rock. I am an island. I have my books and my poetry to protect me. I am shielded in my armor, hiding in my room, safe within my womb. I touch no one, and no one touches me. I am a rock. I am an island. My struggle was similar to hers. I People who are different, I didn't want to touch, and I didn't want them to touch me. Being in a setting with the other, being in a setting with people who are different, was very uncomfortable for me. And Dr. King preached an entirely different message. He preached that uh, life is about living outside of your comfort zone, that you are supposed to engage with those who are different. You're supposed to love your neighbor no matter who they are. But his message isn't unique, right? Jesus had a very similar message. And it seemed like everywhere Jesus went, he was just always making people uncomfortable. Like it just seemed like a theme of his life to cause tension and discomfort. John chapter 4 is a prime example of this. Jesus, he's on his way to Galilee from Judea. And the text says that he's weary from his travel, so he stops, he rests, his disciples go on ahead to, uh, to get food for him. And a woman comes to draw water from the well. And, and from the get-go, this exchange is very uncomfortable. How is it uncomfortable? Well, one, he's in Samaria. He's in Sychar. A nice, respectable Jew would not dare walk through Samaria, even though it was a straight shot. They would walk three times the distance around that land. But Jesus, he's okay with breaking social norms. How else? He... He, he's speaking to a Samaritan woman. The Samaritans were the 
part Jewish, part everything else, infidels of the community. They submitted themselves to pagan worship. They even created their own temple. They were so unclean that Jews wouldn't even walk on their land, let alone talk to these people. But Jesus doesn't care about any of that. But he doesn't just talk to her, does he? What happens in verse 7? He, he wants to drink from her cup. Jesus, are you out of your mind? These people are perpetually unclean. We don't even step on their soil. And you, you want to put your lips on her jar? Jesus doesn't care about any of the social norms. But he still even goes further. This woman is uncomfortable. She's confused as she should be because a nice, good, pious Jew would not dare do the things that Jesus is doing. But then Jesus, he offers her his best. Not his leftovers, his best. You see it when you see the conversation from verse 10 to verse 14. He's offering her this living water. He's offering her this water that will well up to eternal life, this water that will quench her thirst forever. He's offering this to this no good, immoral, perpetually unclean Samaritan, and we know what she doesn't know, and that it is God himself offering his best. And when he does this, he creates a considerable considerable amount of interest in this woman. We see it in verse 15. She says to him in verse 15, Sir, give me this water so I will not have to be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And it's real subtle and sneaky what she's doing there, right? Because we know what's going on. Jesus is about to bring it to light. It's about noon, according to verse 6. This woman is getting water at noon. People don't do that. They come in the morning or in the evening when it's nice and cool. The implication is that this woman is an outcast. She's an outcast among outcasts. She is thought of so poorly in her community that she can't even endure being around her peers. So she goes in the heat of the day to gather water. Now she has this rare opportunity to never have to come to this well again and deal with these issues. So she says, give me this water so I don't have to come here again. Jesus, he hones in on her. It seems like the conversation is changing subjects, but he's actually following a very explicit theme. He says, go call your husband and come here. And she responds back pretty quickly, probably trying to scoop past the issue. She says, I I have no husband. And you would think Jesus would say, I'm sorry, we can just move on here. But no, Jesus, he's getting all in her business. He says, yeah, you're right about that. You have had five husbands. And the one you're with now is not even your husband. I mean, gosh, just a gut punch, right? Yeah, you were having a nice conversation about water. Why'd you have to go there and make things awkward and uncomfortable? It was so, it was so smooth here. But, but Jesus, he's he's wanting to expose the true nature of her thirst. He says, "Go call your husband. Go get your husband. Go get that which you are trying to find ultimate satisfaction from, apart from God." I wonder how Jesus would respond to us in this conversation. He might say, go get your grades. Go get your achievements. Go get your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Go go get your video games or your Netflix account. I don't know. Go get that, which you're trying to find ultimate satisfaction from, but it falls short every time. This woman has had five husbands. And now she's gotten to a point where she's not even holding out for a six. She just said, give me somebody that will do something for me because I have this thirst that I'm trying to satisfy and I just can't seem to hold on to it. Jesus is wanting to quench a greater thirst. There's two responses that happened to this conversation about about thirst. The woman responds in verse 19 and 20. 
She says, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. <laughs> She's trying to get all theological and intellectual with him. She said, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And you try to figure out what's the tone here. But this woman is trying to find a standard of worship. But the problem is, is that she's basing the standard off the traditions and preferences of men. You know, the, the, the Samaritans, they were on Mount Gerasim with their temple, and the Jews, they were in Jerusalem for their temple. They, they're both trying to worship, but the standard is too low. Did you know she didn't even mention God? And some of the greatest tension in the church is because people, men, man has been worshiping on a standard that is too low. It makes me nervous when I have friends who quote church fathers but don't quote scripture. It makes me nervous. Now, don't get me wrong. I love the church. I love historical people. I love them all. Spurgeon, Tertullian, Toge, I, I love all of them. C.S. Lewis. But I can't value their opinion more than the very words of God. Right? Because these men were they were prolific, but they were deeply flawed, right? Just for example, people talk about the golden age of church history. It was the Puritan age. It wouldn't have been golden for me. Puritans owned slaves. That wasn't golden for me. These men were, were flawed. Even as they were prolific, the standard was still too low. The racial divide in denominations in this country is because of a standard that has been too low. Think back to the late 1700s when Richard Allen and some slaves came into this Methodist church and dared to pray in the whites-only section of the church. Before they could even finish their prayer, these white men were so offended that they picked Richard Allen up and threw him out of the church. These slaves were so offended that they banded together and they founded the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the oldest African-American denomination in this country. The standard was too low. And the story is similar with, with other denominations, Baptists, Pentecostals, over and over again, the standard is too low. How else could men come to church and have other men chained in the balcony or locked in the basement? How else could men come to church and not allow another man to enter into the church simply because of the color of his skin? How else could a man come to church and leave and go and tar, burn, and hang a man by his neck simply because of the color of his skin? The standard was too low. <laughs> Got my amen corner. Hallelujah. And by the way, these conversations often feel kind of one-sided, right? They, they often come across as white people need to do more, right? If white people did more, there would be some racial reconciliation. Uh, but honestly, the most pushback I get is from my black brothers and sisters. I tell them about what I see in Scripture, that God wants to unite all people. And they say, nope, I'm good. We'll let Jesus do that when we get to heaven, but we're not worried about that here on earth, as if Jesus didn't say, pray like this. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The standard is too low. And, and, and for them, it's just, it's, the race issue is just so close to home. It's not theoretical for them. I remember growing up and talking to elderly men in my church, uh, my church growing up, and I would, I would see their eyes glaze over as they would talk about history, as they would talk about lynchings, because they could think about their brother or their cousin or their uncle whom they lost from lynching. It's not theoretical for them. It's experiential. They could think back to a time where it didn't matter if you had a degree. It didn't matter if you were a doctor. You were still boy when white folks addressed you. It's not theoretical. It's not textbook. It's experiential. The place where they could have significance, the place where they could have dignity, the place where their voice could be heard was the church. And now you want to disrupt that by bringing us together? Nope. I'm good. The standard is too low. And then Jesus, he responds. We see it in, in verse 21. How do you satisfy this thirst? He says, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain 
nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Notice the contrast in language there. She's talking about our fathers. He's talking about the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. And can we just pause right there and imagine how powerful this is to this woman? Jesus doesn't say God is seeking. He says the Father is seeking. This male imagery, when this woman is facing rejection after rejection from men, I mean, it's possible that these marriages, once, you know, some of them could have been deaths, but it's very unlikely that all of them were deaths. It's pretty probable that she's had multiple divorces. So over and over, she's had to experience, I marry this man, but he doesn't want me. I marry this man, but he doesn't want me. I marry this man, but he doesn't want me. I, I, I'm with a man now that doesn't want me enough to marry me. I go to the well on noonday because the people around me, they don't want me. And now you, Jesus, you, you, you tell me that the Father is seeking me? He wants me? And that's something for somebody in here right now. That you are facing rejection after rejection. You see no worth for yourself. You, you are wrestling with believing that anybody wants you. And you need to hear that the Father is seeking after you. You have value in his sight. The Father is seeking such people to worship him. And then verse 24, probably the most popular verse in this passage. He says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And similar to when John is writing his epistle, when he says God is love, there's this descriptive, little finite uh, explanation about the essence of God. He says God is spirit. God equals spirit. So transitively, uh, when you're worshiping in spirit, you can only do that if you are in God. God is not only the end goal, he's the starting point. And you know what's really scary about that, though? Worshiping in spirit and truth can look exactly like, outwardly, as worshiping in tradition and preference. They can look exactly the same outwardly. And you don't know that they're different until you try to cause tension, until you try to make things uncomfortable. The people who are seeking to worship in spirit and in truth, they can worship any kind of way as long as God is at the center. But not so with people who worship in tradition and preference. They need God, but they also need these other things. I need God plus. I need God plus an acoustic guitar. I need God plus an organ. I need God plus a PowerPoint. I need God plus a bulletin. I need God and these, these things. In his book, Holiness by Grace, Dr. Brian Chappell, he kind of talks about this, this issue. Uh, and he tells these, these unfortunate stories about churches that ended because of tradition and preference. He tells one story in particular about this church that was splitting. People were going to leave this church. Why? Because some people in the church wanted to put cushions on the pews in the sanctuary. And the cushionites, as Dr. Chapel calls them, the, the cushionites could not believe that these non-cushionites, and of course, you know, both sides had their theological backing for you. The cushionites could not believe that the non-cushionites would allow the elderly people in the church to endure such suffering in their lower extremities. We're supposed to take care of the least of these. The non-Kushanites, they could not believe that the Kushanites would dare stifle the, the, the worship in this church by bringing in these wretched cushions to muffle the sound of the music. And people were going to leave the church. The church was splitting, not because of God, but because of tradition and preference. God plus issues. This is what Jesus often had to face with people like the Pharisees. That's the issue that Dr. Martin Luther King often faced. In his most famous piece of literature, a letter from a Birmingham jail, Dr. King conceptualizes these frustrating people as the moderates. 
And I wish I could read the entire letter. It's, it's a long letter, though. I would encourage you to just Google it. It's free online. But I did want to read this bit of passage uh, about Dr. King's thoughts on the frustration of the moderate. He says, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate, who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who, lo who lives by a mythical concept of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. In short, for Dr. King, in his day, he would rather deal with the KKK than the conservative evangelical church. Because at least the KKK won't patronize him with passive, polite indifference. And many of you know who have read this letter that who he's speaking to, he's speaking to clergymen, he's speaking to leaders in the church. He's responding to a news article that they posted entitled, get this, a call for unity. I wish I had time to really get into how counterintuitive that title is. But, so when he is speaking and describing the plight and the suffering of African Americans, when he's explaining the grave injustices that they are experiencing, when he is reminding that what Adolf Hitler did was also legal too, He's speaking to those that name the name of Jesus Christ. The standard was too low. So I'm thankful for men like Dr. King, who are willing to cause tension and discomfort for gospel's sake. But how should we respond? I mean, <laughs> there's so much that could be said, but I think the, the greatest takeaway from this, this passage and the greatest takeaway from Dr. King's life is for us to really challenge our notions about satisfaction in, in Christ. Because being satisfied and being comfortable aren't automatically the same thing. In fact, if you read scripture, there's more often than not when someone is satisfied in God, they're often led to very uncomfortable situations. Can you imagine how uncomfortable the disciples were when Jesus says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, when this racial tension is still very present even in their own hearts? A friend of mine once asked me, Evan, I want to be honest in my heart about racism, but I, and I, if, if, I, if I have racist tendencies, I want to own that. Uh, how do I know if I'm being racist? I don't want to be hypersensitive, but I really want to be honest. I said, that's a, that's a great question, a question that many people are really honestly willing to ask. But honestly, I feel like that question is just speaking to kind of a bigger question, which is, are, are you willing to love people around you regardless Right, Because this passage is not just talking about race issues, right? I mean, there's a lot of barriers that Jesus is trying to break down, right? The, the race, race barrier, culture barrier, gender barrier, he, all these barriers that traditions of men put up, he's trying to tear down. So you, you might wrestle with, with racism, but you, you might just have a problem being around anybody who's different. So you're around, it's hard for you to be around people who are just of a different gender, who are of a different religion, who are of a different culture, who are of a different class, who are of a different hall, God forbid. <laughs> Everybody around you is the same, and it's boring. And it's not the gospel. When Jesus came into this world, he changed everything forever breaking down so many barriers the movie 42 is an incredible movie i'm i'm reinforcing 
uh, Chaplin Lowe's assessment. I, I didn't even know he even saw this, but I do love movies. And, and uh, the movie 42 is an awesome movie. If you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to red box it. Uh, don't pirate it. Uh, so this movie, <laughs> it's about uh, Jackie Robinson, who is the first African-American to enter Major League Baseball. And, and, and his story is so powerful because he came before Martin Luther King Jr. He came before Civil Rights Movement. He was a progenitor in this. It, and his life was incredibly challenging. And this movie captures it very well, the struggle that Jackie Robinson had to face. And there's a scene in the movie in particular that really caught my attention. It's a scene where Pee Wee Reese, he, he walks into the office of Branch Rickey, the executive who brought Jackie Robinson into the MLB. And he's all uh, distraught and upset, and he pulls out this, this, this letter, and uh, he puts it on Branch's desk, and Branch opens it up, and it's, it's a hate, hate letter, uh, because people back home heard about how he's playing with Jackie Robinson, and they're just, they're, it's, it's threatening, it's, it's racial slurs, and, uh, and, and Pee Wee is outraged. He's, he's wanting Branch to do something about it, namely, get Jackie off the team. I mean, he doesn't have a problem with him personally, it's just he doesn't want all this drama in his life. So Branch, he gets up and he walks over to his filing cabinet and he asks Pee Wee, Pee Wee, how many of those letters do you have? And Pee Wee responds back, I, I just have the one. Isn't that enough? And then Branch pulls out multiple folders, thick, just slamming them on the desk, uh, full of hateful, threatening, racist comments. And then Branch looks at Pee Wee with his one little letter, and basically tells him, get over it. You should be proud. And then Pee Wee, he responds back, and I, I, you know, I feel for the man. He says, sir, I just want to play ball. Right? He just, I, I just, he don't want to do all that. I just want to play ball. That's what he signed up for. He just want to play baseball. And then Branch responds back, well, the world's not so simple anymore. I guess it never was. We just ignored it. We can't ignore it now. And we can relate to, to Pee Wee, can't we? I, I just want to play ball. I just want to go to class. I, I just want to hang out with friends. I just want to go to church. I just want to keep things simple. I just want to keep things comfortable. Please don't, don't bring this to me. But when Jesus entered this world, much like when Jackie entered into the MLB, when Jesus did what he did on the cross, he changed everything. And life's just not that simple anymore. Honestly, it never was. It's, it's not about you. You were bought with a price. How should we respond? I began this by talking about verse 4, about how Jesus had to pass through Samaria. And that, that sentence makes a little more sense when you read verse 34. The disciples, they come back, they're trying to, to feed Jesus. They went off to get food. They come back, let, you know, let's, let's eat. And Jesus responds to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. He says, I, I have to do God's will. I feed off of God's will. And God's will is to tear down the barriers and the traditions that have been erected by man. And he's inviting us to participate. Let us seek to do the will of God. Let us seek to feast on the gospel and not our own comforts and self-indulgence. For it is there in the gospel that we find satisfaction. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we confess that we are often wanting to fulfill our will above fulfilling yours. Lord, thank you for your word that it, that it convicts and it encourages. Lord, I ask that you would pull us out of our comfort that you would remind us that the Holy Spirit is within us and you lead us to places that are strange, but they are places that are gospel-led. 
Lord, I thank you for Dr. King and his life. I pray that we would be inspired by the work that he did, that he was a man that was deeply flawed, but he is not the standard. You are. Remind us of that, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.